Uh, it's now my privilege to introduce our two speakers today. They come to us from across the pond in England and uh, have great background in business, and I think it's a, a great privilege for us to hear from them. We'll first hear from Brother Roger Jones. He was born in Bath, England, has four children, has a wide variety of professional qualifications, including uh, professional engineering certifications in England, California, and Texas. He's worked with Rolls-Royce, Aero Engines, Kellogg International Corporation, and had 25 years with Kinetics Technology International Corporation. And uh, watched this company grow from six people to over 500 people. Um, I have a little experience with watching small ventures grow, and I can tell you that the first four or five people you hire are fundamental to the success of your company. Brother Jones has uh, had wide experience in the church, serving from full-time missionary in Australia, Switzerland, to a mission president, mission president's counselor, a bishop, branch president, and patriarch for 40 years. After hearing from Brother Jones, we'll hear from Edward Keith Wigglesworth. Brother Wigglesworth was my mission president from 20 years ago, and I owe a lot to this man, what I learned from him. He has uh, four children, born in Leeds, England, attended school at the City and Guilds of London Institute, University of London, and was a senior lecturer at Berkshire College of Art. He was also the owner of a small business, growing it with his father and son to 42 people when the business was sold in 1992. He has served as a branch president, stake president, regional representative, mission president, and a few of you know him when he was serving at the MTC in Preston, England. I'd now like to take the time to turn it over to Brother Jones. After hearing from him, we'll hear from Brother Wigglesworth. Thank you. Dr. Earl, members of the faculty, and students, aloha. Aloha. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> in the Brigham Young University, uh, in Utah especially, and now in Hawaii, the Deseret, or honeybee, was depicted by the hive on the Utah descriptions. Shakespeare also did. For so work the honeybees, creatures that by some rule of nature teach the act of order to a peopled kingdom. They have a king and officers of sorts where some like magistrates correct at home, others like merchants venture trade abroad. Others, like soldiers, armored in their stings, make boot upon the summer's velvet buds, which pillage they with merry march bring home to the tent royal of the emperor, who, busied in his majesty, surveys the singing masons building roofs of gold, the civil citizens kneading up the honey, the poor mechanic Porters crowding in their heavy burdens at his gate. The sad eyed justice with his surly hum, delivering ore to executors pale, the lazy, yawning drone that depicts some in here in their various positions, which ultimately you will fulfill, which I have been fortunate to fulfill. And I think what I'll do is talk a little bit about uh, general business principles, the order of the hive. In fact, let me uh, express on the board the uh, matrix of business. Each one of us in this room is enclosed within this matrix. On the x-axis, well, let's use a different one. On the x-axis, we have energy. Uh, 
And from zero, presumably the lazy yawning drone, to 100% is the energy quotient. On the y-axis is intellect. Are you getting the picture? Will you piece within your mind, ultimately, when you graduate, etc., where you fit in this matrix? Because we go from zero to 100 in the intellect. Now, right in the middle is the 50-50. And remember, the definition of average is the worst of the best and the best of the worst. You will fit somewhere in this, these four quadrants. Let me describe them. We have the high intellect, but the low energy. Now, we won't tell President Will write this, but these are the presidents of universities. <laughs> They're the presidents of companies. They're the generals in the army. They have great intellect. That you can tell President Will, right? <laughs> but the low energy quotient is because they want every done, everything done in the least amount of resource, the least cost, the least schedule, and that's the line management, which you as an entrepreneur, as a one man, and then building out, will be. Now over here is the staff management. You see what it is? Is high intellect and high energy. Everything can be done six different ways, and they think up six different ways to, to do a certain task. These are the staff. These are the researchers. Maybe you'll fit into that category. But they certainly are in this quadrant, which is high intellect and high energy. I remember being in uh, a conference in Washington, D.C. There were 6,000 of us, politicians, businessmen, engineers. And it was John Glenn, the astronaut, who conducted and gave the opening speech on energy, which is one of my expertise. And he said there was a physicist, an engineer, and an economist. And uh, for five days, they were washed up on a desert island. And then a can of spinach got washed up. And the physicist said, I'm useful to you guys. I will focus the sun's rays onto the can, open it, I'm useful. And the engineer, which I am, said, well, I'm useful to you guys. I will tell you the exact plane of stress that that can will open at. I don't like sand in my spinach. And he said, then the economist, who said to the group, well, let's assume we have a can opener. <laughs> you get the message. <laughs> Somewhere in here are the intellects of high energy, but don't do too much. On the one hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, these are the ones that advise the decision makers. And now we come down to this quadrant. What we see is low intellect, low energy. These are the privates in the army. I hope there are no military people as privates here. But they do things, and they're very important. They're the work of bees. But they need to be told what to do by this line management, the generals, etc. And so those are important, and any company, of course, you might fall into that category. Well, then we come to this last category, High, low energy. Uh, sorry, low intellect and high energy. They're always doing things, busy as bees. Unfortunately, everything they do is wrong. What do we do with them? Well, those we transfer to the competition. Remember that. <laughs> and so we have the experience of the honeybee hive. We have somewhere in that quadrant, 
as you go through your development in your career, you will figure out where you fit. Think about it and know that which is best suited for you. And so we now move, I think, to uh, away from the business principles very quickly. And we go to the personal story of mine. And if you can pick a few nuggets of interest which will help you in your careers, please do so. Remember, it's the person that you're developing, not the company that you're developing to make money or to generate employment. We all are blind until we see that in the human plan, nothing's worth the making if it doesn't make the man. Why build the city's glories if man unbuilded goes? In vain we build the world unless the builder also grows. And so I tell my story. Back in uh, the beginning of my career, I worked for an aeronautics company, Rolls-Royce. My only claim to fame in that was that I designed part of the combustion system for the Concorde aircraft. That was very interesting. I learned something in that about the honeybee. We're back to the honeybee. According to all theories of aerodynamics, the honeybee, because of its wingspan to weight ratio, is unable to fly. But the honeybee, being unaware of these scientific truths, goes ahead and flies anyway and makes a little honey every day. You are those honeybees. The impossible to others in the entrepreneurial spirit is that which says, I can do it. I may have a big weight and I may have a low wingspan, but I will make honey every day and I will fly. So fly. Well, I went and we very quickly go through my experience in that five years with the aeronautics company. No more to be said about that, except now I, pay, I take a, a course, a long course. It was called Heat and Mass Transfer Applied to the Thermal Power and Process Industry. Took a year's postgraduate work at it. Came out of that, came down from 30,000 feet to ground level into petrochemical and into uh, refinery work. Enjoyable. I became a specialist first. You will need some speciality to start out on your road. Gain it. In mine, it was the design of fired heaters. I mean, these fired heaters were sometimes twice the size of this room. It had burners in the bottom and the tubes all went through and the oil came in and it heated it. Always needs an energy source and a refinery. And so for, nine, for six years, I worked at it being a specialist. You know what a specialist is? One who knows more and more about less and less until he knows everything about nothing. <laughs> So when you get into that speciality, widen it out and make sure you don't stay there. And so I became the head of the group in fired heaters. And then after 10 years, I saw an advert in the paper. And that advert said, fired heater designer needed in the USA. Well. I had already been promoted, now project engineering manager. And Dr. Earl will know something about this in civil engineering. In, in total refineries, you need to put the foundations in, huge foundations of concrete. Then you bring the structural steel with the structural steel engineers. Then you bring all of the mechanical equipment, $10 million uh, compressors and heat exchangers and pressure vessels, etc., etc. Then you bring in the piping. There are hundreds, uh, miles and miles of piping on a refinery. 
And then you bring the cable electrical in, so you have the electrical engineers. Then you bring all of the wiring in the control room. And so every different engineer is involved, and out of the speciality I was put. Well, just as I was promoted, up came this advert. We want to work a condition, an office, new office, in Southern California. We don't have a fired heater one. They're all on the East Coast. And to cut a long story short, after three months, uh, while they were advertising in the city, you're going to have to learn about uh, the laws of uh, uh, the land. We had to advertise. One month, if there were no takers in San Marino, then you have to advertise for a month in the state. And if you advertise there and no takers, then you advertise uh, nationally in the, in the USA. After three months, they said, the job is yours, and I came. Well, that was interesting. I'm not going to tell you too many stories, except I was a fired heater designer again. Not a non-specialist as a project manager. Well, we did get a job in the state. There were no revenues coming in. There were five of us, a president, a vice president, a design engineer, and an accountant and an estimator. Well, we kept bidding, and I was told the day after I arrived, go and talk with uh, Parsons. I went down there, and they said, well, show us what you can do. We had nothing in the States, and that's where the entrepreneurial spirit. We got a job after six, six weeks. They said, you'll never get it. But we did. We were like that honeybee that flies and makes a little honey out. 2.3 million we bid it for. They came back and said, you're too expensive. Immediately the president said, what can we do to bring the price down? I said, well, you've got four convections on the top of these four boxes. Put it across, because I'd already done it in my previous company. And sure enough, we did it. He didn't do any calculations. They're called lost leaders. He said, the price is now two million, without any calculations or estimating. That's the risks you take. And uh, ultimately, I became the project manager. Now, now I'm really, you know, the project managers, and some of you will become that, is I used to tell clients when I headed up that, you can have it cheap, you can have it fast, and you can have it right. Now, which two do you want? Any project that you're doing, fast, cheap, or right, but only two. And that's the mechanics of project management. And so we went and we developed. And in that development, we went into not just fired heaters. Now we moved into the total plants. Let me read a letter. Uh, after our 10 years in the company. Oh, 25 years I was with it. Dear Roger, the company, uh, let's make sure we have the correct uh, letter. Well, I didn't bring it with me, but I have two which we'll finish up with. And he says, these are the three things that I like about you and want to continue to work with you. Your stability, be stable in your this is after 10 years. Your high morals, too. And your sense of humor. So those are the three applied to me. Make sure you incorporate them into your lifestyle and your business. After one more story, after one, three years later, we had the president of the whole worldwide company he came to me in my office and said, I saw two of yours yesterday. And uh, he said, Dalton and Thompson. Well, when you have the president of the worldwide company that's over there in Europe coming into your office, you think, who are Dalton and Thompson? Well, in 10 seconds, I figured out who they were. He must have been up at BYU Provo, which he was. And 
Fortunately, uh, Thompson was the one that baptized my wife when she was 18, and Dalton, I had met his father in England, etc., etc. And so it was that uh, uh, we enjoyed talking about the two. Didn't tell me what they wanted to talk about, but I called up uh, Thompson later on that week, and he said, oh yes, we had Jake come, because Jake had said, my, I had a problem with language when I went to Provo BYU, he said, and my cigars had to be put away, and that was a funny point from it. Anyway, I talked from Thompson, he said, yes, we had written a paper on who should be kept within the company, what are the criteria for selecting an individual who should be giving a part share ownership of the company. Well, I was in Philadelphia trying to put right a $50 million project that was already costing $55 million. So I was waiting for the call, and sure enough, the president called. I thought, I, I'm, I don't work for this company anymore. I called him back. He said, I wanted to do this right before your very eyes. Oh, he's going to sack me. He said, no, we've selected three in the USA company, which was now 200 people, to give them a 1% share ownership of the company. And so I was given that uh, privilege of now being an owner of the company. Three weeks later, we sold the company for $42 million. So it was a very nice, profitable exchange that we had. I've come to the end of that, which I'm able to say because of time, but make sure that as you go through your life, don't just concentrate on your business principles. Alongside is your financial responsibility to your families and your children. And so learn about stocks and shares and bonds. Since 30, I had been learning this as a parallel issue, 401k plan, setting uh, goals of... Uh, uh, Victory goals. Any time you can set a victory goal, be it one person in your company or three, have a victory party. And then you've had a few of the nuggets that I have learned. I will close and say to you that with another piece of Shakespeare, as I began with, you, as I did, as Cassius said, to Brutus when they were to assassinate Caesar, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their lives is spent in shallows and in miseries. On such a sea are we now afloat and we must catch the current as it flows or lose our venture. You potential entrepreneurs, go out and grasp it. Be the honey bee. I thank you. Good morning and aloha. aloha. I'm most grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. I spent uh, many years in, in college as a lecturer myself, just love the ambience and the atmosphere and I'm grateful to President Wheelwright and to uh, uh, Professor Earl to, uh, for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to be talking to you just uh, with a few snippets that may be helpful to you from my life uh, in the little things that I learned that helped in building a small business. We went, uh, and we called it, would you believe, uh, following the previous speaker, Beehive Press. <laughs> and so uh, we had the same sort of feel, here's the honeybee. Anyway, uh, this is what it was called, and it was Father Son me and my son who started it, and in 10 years we had over 40, which is a lot for printing works, uh, working for us. Uh, but when at the time it was sold, it was one and a half million turnover, which was good. 
Okay, let me start with one thing that you've got already. You're already here. I was a slow starter. I've got to tell you, my father was a printer. I became a printer. Just didn't know for. But then one day, I was in the print factory downtown in this city in Leeds. And I looked out the window and I saw all these people walking up and down the street, hundreds of them. And I thought, I know what I'm doing here. I'm in this factory eight till five. What on earth are they doing? I want some of that. And I guess you're already at that point because you want to have more. You want to be one of the haves rather than the have-nots, I take it. And so I began to ask myself, where do I want to be in five, ten years' time? What, do I want to just be a printer? It was a great job and I enjoyed it, but is that what I want? And so, ambition. You've got to have ambition. You've got it. And somebody said to me, and here's one for you to remember, you can count how many seeds there are in an apple, but you can't know how many apples there are in a seed. And I would suggest to you that you're the seeds. You can count how many seeds are in an apple, but you can't know how many apples are in a seed. Your potential is great. You have no idea what it is, but you plan it, and you make it. And I realized, <clears throat> if it's to be, it's up to me. And so what did I want to do? I wanted to improve my standard of life, my, my quality of life. So I decided, what am I good at? What do I want to do? Well. So I come to the point you're at later in life, went back to college, studied, got my teacher's certificate and got a degree, and then took a post at Berkshire <coughs> College of Art, which is just west of London, uh, in teaching printing and graphics. Loved it. It's a great profession. But without insulting uh, Professor Earl, who, by the way, I was privileged to have him as a, a missionary. And when I said to him, you, to his children as well, I said, he was the best. Very modestly, he said, no, President, one of the best. <laughs> and he, <laughs> but it's true, he was, there was none better. He was wonderful. And so I, I uh, enjoyed teaching, but came to the realization, so this is where you put the fingers in your ear, it's a great profession, but you'll never be rich. Teachers, it's a wonderful profession, but if you want more, and if you want the other things in life, you've got to look a little bit further. So that was what happened to me. Uh, I started then to think, well, what, what opportunities have I got? My opportunity came when, years after, when my son came back off his mission, he'd been in France, and guess who his mission president was? President Max Wheelwright, which is the father of President Steve Re Wheelwright, right now, who is your president here at the college. And I uh, thought, so, wow, that's, that's a coincidence right now. But he had print works. He'd already told my son about printing as well as taught him how to do mission work in France. And uh, so he was interested. So we decided we start. Father and son start a press. How were we going to do it? So we did a bit of market research, which I'm sure you do. Whatever you choose to do, you've got to look and say, where's the opening? And we were sticking with print, and we found there was an opening, but we needed to get a start. And so I got one person who I knew, a businessman, and he said, I'll give you, to help you start, I'll give you all the printing work that I do if you do it at the same price or less than I'm already paid. Wow, that was great, that was a start, that was the basic. But there's a snag with that, that got us going, but we have a saying in England, maybe the same here, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that was the danger, you can lose them just as easy as you got them. And so, uh, we, uh, we started with that one person, but we needed a plan of action to improve and to look for opportunities to increase. And so, uh, for that, from that point of view, uh, we, we looked at, and Roger's already done this, somebody said to me, hey, your pricing is wrong on your jobs. And, and so I'll phrase it the way we had it, you can have speed, quality and price, but 
which two do you want, which is really the same as you've already had. But that, if you make a note of that, that's how it's going to be out in the industry for you. Speed, quality, price. Really, you've got to choose two because that affects the price of the product that you're going to do. If you want all three, boy, the price is going to be high. Okay, what advice can I give you that will be helpful? That was most helpful, you already know, I think, which is networking. Networking is the answer to everything. Well, you know, in the church, if you're members of the church, referrals, same thing, but networking, or in, as some people call it, relationship contacting, is probably the way that we, the major way in which we started. Think of a big company. How big? Coca-Cola. Nabisco, if you know, I hope you know Nabisco over here. But, uh, you know, potato chips for cereals, all those sort of things. Big company in England, I think it's an American company, so you should know it. Toys R Us, Hallmark, all these people became, from this little print shop, <laughs> became our customers. How did we do it? Networking. So we found somebody, for example, uh, with um, the potato chips in Nabisco, and uh, he worked for that company. I said, will you introduce us to the print buyer? Oh, I'll do that, but you know, oh, he didn't want to know. He got loads of printers, uh, didn't need us, but they have print, the big companies have print lists, and unless you're on that list, you ain't gonna do anything. We wanted to get on that list. And so on one occasion, whilst talking to him and make, trying to make friends with him through this networking contact, he said, okay, I have a job, we have a factory in the north of England, and uh, it works shift work, producing potato chips. The six o'clock shift on such and such a day, they'll have run out of this printed material which they've got to have to put in each box. Uh, if you can take that, and we'll do it. You would have done the same, wouldn't you? We worked night and day to get it done in time. The printer he was going to use couldn't do it and let him down. We worked night and day. We finished it the night before the shift, the six o'clock morning shift. Now we've got to get it up to the north of England to get it to the factory. We couldn't trust the delivery company, so we put it in a van, drove it up there ourselves overnight, and we were there at the gates in time. Now, do you think Nabisco were impressed? No, they didn't even know. That's a minor thing to them. But do you think the print buyer for Nabisco was impressed? You bet he was. I got him off the hook. And so suddenly the floodgates opened. We were on the list for this massive company. We did the same with Coca-Cola. They only have a few printers. They said nobody could do all Coca-Cola's printing. So what am I saying? Aim high. You could do, we found if you apply to whatever you're thinking you might go into in, in, uh, in your uh, business, uh, we found that we spent as much time doing a tiny business card and a few stationary letterheads, we spent as much time doing that and making ten, $10 as doing a bigger job, staying, same time on the press, uh, you know, same play making and everything, where we could make $50. So we looked at that pricing and we made sure we aimed for those things that would make us the best return. Okay, I'm sure that was pretty obvious to you before, but I hope it, uh, it worked for me. And I, what I realized, and the advice to you is, if you're afraid of hard, hard work, don't start your own business. We had to work hard, and, uh, and maybe uh, you've got to look at this and say, oops, can't work tonight, it's home evening. You know, getting up with your church members, and you've got a family by now, maybe at that time. You know, here's the seeds in the apple, well, well what? You might have lots of apples later on. And so it's home evening. Uh-uh. I've got to work and get this job out. So my advice to you would be, don't forget the family. You're going to measure against your work, but you might have to move home evening. I, can only, I can't do it this Monday. I've got to work. I won't be home till 9 o'clock, whatever. You, hard work is the only way you will get your business going. But don't ignore the other important things for your family. Just move them aside or whatever you feel you can do. I hope that's uh, good advice. As the staff grew, I realized that uh, Roosevelt used this uh, 
statement. He said, uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick, you know? <laughs> and you've got to do that with the stuff. They've got to know who's boss. And as, it, as you get bigger and you can uh, delegate your responsibilities and work perhaps less hours, but you've got to let them know just who it is that's the boss without being unkind. And perhaps the best advice of all to give you is one more thing. And it seems unkind, but it's true. Trust no one where money is concerned in business. I could spend an hour telling you some of the tragedies that I've experienced and other businessmen have experienced. You cannot trust people with money. And it's your money. And they, they're happy to, to steal it from you. And there might be the... This man I'm thinking of right now grew up with my son in the church, good man. It was my fault when I looked back on it because in those days you had to have two signatures on the checks. He was the financial man and he would say to me, oh, just sign this check, a couple of checks and I've got some, some things that I've got to do and you're going back to college. I stayed at college, still lecturing during this time. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, no trouble. Because I totally trust him. He's now got blank checks. It needs a second signature, that's him. I was foolish doing that because the temptation was too great. Make sure you've got a firm control on the finance that you have. He was writing checks out to himself and it wasn't until a month later when we were checking on the accounts, said, hey, where's the balance? Said, oh, oh, it's okay, I, I'm dealing with it a little bit behind. What? A month later, uh, you know, that's two months. Hey, what's going on? And my son caught him wiping everything off the disc so we couldn't track him. And then, sadly, we sack him on the spot, but I took some responsibility for that. Do you see what I'm saying? There are lots of experiences that I had where you cannot trust, even if the church members, I'm sorry, but it's sound advice. It doesn't mean to say they're not good friends. It doesn't mean to say that you've got, you know, you're good pals together. Get it in writing. If it's a partnership in your business, people steal your business, walk out on you and take the work with them and things like that. You be very cautious. I have to say that's one thing I learned the hard way in business. Okay. Um, I was pleased that we took the advice of a good accountant and that's one thing that you need to do. Get a good accountant. He can save you money. He can tell you how to pay less tax if it is. So you pay the amount that's due, but uh, for example, buying equipment, buying machinery is tax relief. And also, I was grateful now when I look back, who wants to talk about pensions? No, you're never gonna need a pension, you'll live forever. It comes up, it creeps up on you. You make sure this good accountant has put savings, and pensions and investment. And then my son, I've just time to tell you, in the early stages of this, so you can perhaps see it yourself. So here's Coca-Cola and Nabisco, whoo, walloping great checks coming in this month. Oh, look at that bank statement. What did he do? Went out and bought a Ford Cosworth. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a super duper uh, Ford car from years ago anyway, which uh, was a rally car. I said, Stephen, what else are you doing? Oh, we've got lots of money, got lots of stuff coming in, don't worry about it. What, it. what happened two months later, we're bumping along the bottom because all the suppliers are wanting to pay in and we were late getting checks in from the big companies. No, caution. Only spend what you've got. Don't, don't think you're, you're richer than you were. Be careful with it and have a good accountant. Okay. Um, I guess in closing, for me, I look at uh, the quality of life uh, that, it, that it's given me. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with being rich. It's what you do with it. And uh, I learned a lesson here, that what goes around comes around. Believe me, that is true. And so, uh, one day, Long, long time ago, this lesson, if I can tell you, my wife and I were going to the temple in England 
and uh, this was a long time ago, so when the roads weren't brilliant, and it was very misty, and we had to travel overnight for the distance it was to get there early morning for the temple session. So we set off with another couple. Oh boy, what a journey it was. And we got the other side of London into the country lanes out of gas. It was about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and we pulled up. What are we going to do? Well, as good uh, Christians would do, we, we prayed. And then we sat in the car and thought, what's going to happen now? At that time in the morning, in the country lane, this man comes walking up the road. I jumped out of the car and said, hey, hey, we're out of gas, can you help us? Oh, just, just come with me. Walk down this country lane in the dark, there's a barn. He opened the barn door and gave me a can of gas. I said, wow, how much do I owe you? And this has stayed with me, and I hope that you remember this all my life. He said, I don't want anything. All I want is a promise that you will do the same for someone when the opportunity arises. Boy, I got back in the car and we're driving and I thought, hang on a minute, where did he come from? Out in the countryside there and a, and a can of gas. It stayed with me, I promise you. What goes around comes around and I've always tried to do that in my life. If you're successful, you don't throw your money around, but if you see a need, Believe me, you'll be blessed for sharing your benefits with others. I hope these thoughts will have been helpful to you. I would just say, if there's anything that I could have done better, I could have done it faster than we did, but there would have been risk-taking, and you're going to have to decide on those sort of things yourself. And I would have saved more money and put it aside from the business, because if you don't, you tend to use it. So God bless you in your future and in your business and mahalo. We do have a few minutes for questions and hopefully some answers as well. I do want to just remind you of, uh, actually remind you of one thing and make an announcement to you of another. The reminder again is for the workshop tonight at 7 o'clock, and the announcement is that this week the Curriculum Committee and the Dean's Council have approved for us to have a minor and a new certificate in entrepreneurship. This is very exciting for us to have. <laughs> so we, we hope that you'll be looking at that and consider that in your courses. There's one particular course we'd highly recommend you be thinking of taking next semester, and that is our Entrepreneurship 180 course. We anticipate teaching it. It's a two-hour course that will be taught uh, Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday at the 12:10 time for you. So, if either of those can work for you, please look at taking that Entrepreneurship 180 class. So, let's turn the, the next uh, five or six minutes over to question. If any of you have any of that. You guys want to come back up here for a second? Take something if they have a question for you. Anybody have a question? Over here. Brother Wiggles. So, so he's partly asking um, about trusting people, but also we need capital ourselves mm -hmm. to start up businesses. So how do you kind of tie that in? Well, you can be trusted. <laughs> it's the other people I'm worried about. No, yes, you need, uh, you need friends who, who can trust you. Is that what you mean? You need the capital. Uh, but say a man comes to you, and this is what I had, happened to me and he wanted 28,000 pounds 
and he said, I just need some capital to see me over, and on a Monday, I'll pay you back. And I said, mm, even though he's a friend, and he gives me a letter, promissory note, that he'd give it back Monday. Did I get it? No. Did I get it Tuesday? No. Did I get it Wednesday? No. I never got it. So you've got to know who you're working with, if that, if that answers your question. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. So both of you, from what I understand correctly, one in engineering and one in printing, you both kind of started there. And then your entrepreneurial efforts kind of branched off from those industries. So a lot of us graduating soon, I think, have that question. So our entrepreneurial um, events later in life will stem from our our careers and our, our first jobs. Mm -hmm. So a question heavily on my mind is like, how do I make sure that my first jobs are ones that I can use later to uh, be an entrepreneur? Do you want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> I will express to you, as on the board, you have to know human nature. And while you are one, the world is open, you have no problems. The integration of the staff and the line function is you. You are it. Now as it develops, now you set the problems. At two, when you bring your second employer, now you've doubled the interaction of your problems between human nature. I remember uh, reading a book uh, what presidents think about at night. And J.F. Kennedy was asked that question. And he said, I go into a meeting with 50 people. They've forgotten more than I've ever known about the subject. My problem is the cussedness of human nature. Remember that while you're one, <laughs> but as you develop, it's not an arithmetic progression. When you get to three, it's not one plus one plus one, three times the problems. You now have one times two times three, which is six. Add a fourth one on, now you're into one times two times three times. You've got 24 times the problems, and in that, learn human nature. And the, the expertise that you have is developed within that 500 in my case when we finish the company. Work at it, no human nature. Get some psychology in there, as J.F. Kennedy said, the cussedness of human nature. Then 50 down the road, you're away and running, hopefully. But if you're thinking of where do I start, what do yeah. I do, right from the beginning, I, I ask myself that, what am I good at? What do I like? What do I enjoy? And nobody can answer that for everybody different. Yeah. And you, you're going to have to choose. And either you're going to start a small business on your own or take on a franchise. Who knows? You know, who, who wants to do McDonald's, that's a, whatever franchises. You know, but something like that. Or, as Roger did, goes into qualified business and climb the ladder there. That, that's only something that you can answer, I think, for yourself. Yeah. Okay, let's thank them.